Good morning, everyone. It is our final Sunday that we're busy with this series, The Art of War. So thank you for joining us today. My name is Louis Skippers. And um, for those of you who don't know me, I have the privilege of being married to a beautiful wife for 14 years now. And I've got two girls, a three-year-old and a six-year-old. And Abigail, my oldest, she has never been one to really like things with wheels on them. Like my youngest, if you give her something with wheels on it and she won't get off of it. Like every day she wants to get on a bicycle and go around the block. My oldest, she's kind of like, I'll ride on dad's bike, that's fine. Like I'll be on the seat in the back. But Abigail got for her birthday a big old bike. No more training wheels, actually came in the box, but I told her there's no training wheels in the box and she did find them. But um, our deal is no more training wheels. And she knows bicycles. She's been on the back of my bicycle since she was three when she started coming to school. Every day we come on an e-bike, unless it's like lower, colder than minus 10 or it's snowing. We're always on a bike. So she knows a bike. She loves to be on the bike. She's got a helmet. She's got gear. Um, Now that she's learning to ride herself, that she can put on her to protect her wrists and her elbows and her knees and whatever you want to protect But yet, she won't get on that bicycle without my help. Because when she gets on that bicycle, she's unsteady, and she's afraid that she will fall. But the moment that I hold the saddle, and I tell her, like, I've got you, I'll make sure that you don't fall, she is fine to go around the block. I'm just not allowed to let go of the saddle. And I was just thinking, as this week we went around the block, I was thinking, of the series that we're busy with, The Art of War, where we've already spoken about the fact that there is a spiritual world around us, there is a real enemy seeking to destroy us, and we've already heard about God's armor, all the different pieces that he gives us to protect us. But no matter how much knowledge we have, no matter how much we know these things, we all get moments in life where we get unsteady on our bicycles, when we feel weak, when we feel like I'm not able to stand in these challenges that's coming my way. We all get to moments in our life where we need a hand on the saddle to just give us that assurance that no matter what, we are safe. And I was thinking of this series, how we've spoken about this whole um, armor of a Roman soldier. But what I realized is that every Roman soldier that had an armor, that armor came from a commander or a king. That soldier was trained by someone to be good at what they do in war. Those soldiers were given orders in how to strategically face their enemy. They didn't have to just do it on their own. And we as Christians also have a commander and a king. Someone that gave us the armor, someone who wants to train us, and someone who wants to give us strategic insights in how to live this life to the fullest, to the way God intended. But the problem is when we lose connection, when we lose communication with our king, when we lose connection with God, we lose the ability of that backing that helps us to be steady in life. And today our topic is when to bend the knee. Because any soldier knows that you don't just surrender to the enemy. You don't just bend a knee for anything. But there is a time for every soldier to bend the knee, and I don't believe that is in front of your enemy. I believe that is in front of your king. That is in front of God. And we are going to be talking about this final topic today, when to bend the knee, and we are reading the closing remarks of Paul as he's writing to a church in Ephesus. He warned them at the beginning of the... um, Ephesians 6, what is it, verse 12 or something. He warns them about the spiritual war, about the enemy. He then goes and he tells them about the armor. We spoke about all of the different pieces over the last couple of weeks. But then his closing remarks, he ends with these words. Ephesians 6, verse 18 to 20. It's on the screen. If you've got a Bible, you can open to that. We're going to go through it verse by verse. But um, it's on the screen for you as well. Verse 18. Paul says, and now pray... In the Spirit, on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me, 
that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. A soldier can have the best armor in the world. But if he loses connection with command control, with with wherever strategic orders come from, he loses his ability to stand firm. He's going to grow tired. He's going to lose vision of what they are busy with, where they are going. They're going to feel shaky. They're going to feel isolated and alone. And that is what I realize when Paul ends with prayer is he doesn't want us to look at the armor and be like, yes, I can be strong in God, but then lose sight of the fact that we need to remain connected to our commander, to our king. There is power behind the armor. It's not an armor that we physically put on. It is not just knowledge that we have of something that's sitting in a closet. It is the power of God available to us as, as believers, and the power behind it is, it is God himself. And therefore, Paul says, how do you stay connected? Prayer. And prayer is a final piece of the armor. And today we're going to be talking about four guidelines for prayer in your life. And whether you are a Christian, whether you are still exploring Christianity, here's something interesting. More and more research shows us that all people pray. The moment people go through a crisis, they pray even if they call themselves non-religious. Because we all know there must be something bigger, there must be something higher But I believe that is God, that is Jesus. And I'm going to give you four things that we learn from Paul today about prayer that is not a recipe for how exactly to build your prayer life, but it is principles that will help you in your prayer life so that you can stay connected. What kind of prayer do you need in your life to help you connect to the living God? What kind of prayer do you need to be the power um, behind your, your sails? And what we're going to be talking about today, the first thing that Paul says is we have to pray with support. That's the first thing. Pray with support. He says in verse 18, pray in the Spirit. When he starts, he doesn't go, he doesn't say like, hey, go into your room and shut the door and go on your knees and then pray the following words. He says, the first thing he says, pray in the Spirit. And why? Because when he talks about prayer now, this is specifically related to spiritual warfare. And I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you face some kind of significant challenge, whether that was something spiritual or a very big health crisis or a financial crisis or an issue with a friend or a family that hurt you so deeply that you have no other choice but to pray for it. But when you want to pray for it, you don't have the words. You don't even know what to say. Or you've prayed for it so many times that you're like, I don't want to just repeat the same words over and over. I don't know how to pray anymore. I don't know what to say. I don't know if my prayers are going through. Like, What do we do when we get to a moment like that? Paul wrote to the church in Romans a very similar concept, but with a bit more detail. And in Romans 8 verse 26, he says this. He says, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. I want you to say that with me. The Holy Spirit helps us in our? Not in our strength, not in our boldness, not in our courage, not in the times when we are strong. He helps us in our weakness. And then he says, for example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows All hearts knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. We are not on our own in prayer. That's what Paul is saying. We we pray in the Spirit. The Bible says that if you are a Christian, the moment that you surrender your life to Jesus, you receive the Holy Spirit. Part of the triune God. God is one God, three persons. And part of the triune God, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in us. And every time that you are weak, every time that you don't have the words, every time that you don't even know how to express it, 
The Holy Spirit does what you cannot do. We are not on our own in prayer. Rely on the Spirit to guide you and do what you cannot. You see, the problem is we as human beings in the 21st century, in the Western world, we want quick fixes. We want to put a $10 note in a machine and something pops out. And we want to often treat prayer and we want to treat God that way. We were like, God, I just don't want to say a quick prayer. I'm in a crisis. You tell me exactly what to do or you'll solve my problem and I'm good. But it doesn't always work that way. And we get so impatient, then rather than listening to the Spirit's guidance, we give up when we don't get the quick fix. See, we need to learn how to become content with moments of silence. Because can you remember, we pray in the Spirit and He intercedes for us on our behalf when we are weak. Not when we're strong. Not when we have all the words in the world to pray. Not when I know exactly what to say. But there's moments when I feel weak, when I have no words. We need to learn how to become content with silence. Because if you read through the Bible, most often God speaks in moments of silence. See, here's the reality about any conversation. As long as I'm talking, I cannot hear what you're saying. It's only when I remain quiet long enough for you to get a word out that I can hear what you're saying. And it's weird how we work with God. God created us in His image. And we have all of these communication skills with each other, but suddenly when it comes to God, we don't apply them. We get uncomfortable when there's not an immediate answer. And God is like, just give me a minute. Wait and listen. In our weakness, He's there for us. But it might mean that you have to go and sit with open hands and wait on Him rather than telling Him what to do. The second thing that Paul says is we have to pray constantly. He says on all occasions and with all kinds of prayers and requests. Not only in good times, Not only in bad times, he says all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. He says in Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17, he writes to the church, pray without ceasing. Never stop praying. He writes to the church in Philippi, Philippians 4 verse 6, don't worry about anything. You know all the stuff that eats you up, that causes anxiety and stress? He says stop worrying about it. Instead, pray about everything. But we don't do this. We're all guilty of this, that we don't pray on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. We don't see, we we give up, we cease. And the problem is that we often view prayer as some kind of recreational activity. I read this incredible piece by Elizabeth Elliot. She was a a missionary and wrote a whole bunch of books. And I'm just going to read this because I can't say better than she says this. She said, and, and this makes so much more sense. The first time I read it, I was in South Africa, and this example didn't make that much sense. Now, now it makes more sense, okay? People who ski happen to enjoy skiing. Only skiing I could do in South Africa was maybe down a sand dune. People who ski happen to enjoy skiing. They have time for skiing. They can afford ski- to ski. They are good at skiing. I have found that I often treat prayer as though it were a sport like skiing. Something you do if you like it, something you do in your spare time, something you do if you can afford the trouble, something you do if you're good at it, otherwise you do without it, most of the time. When you get in a pinch, you try it, and when you call, and then you call on an expert. But prayer isn't a sport, it's work. Prayer is work because a Christian simply can't make a living without it. We treat prayer like skiing. We turn it into a recreational activity that we only participate in when we feel like it, when we have the time, when we feel we're good at it, or when we're in a crisis. But Paul says you should always be praying. And remember, again, we're reading in the context of spiritual warfare. Why does he say never stop praying? Because, listen, when things go south, you don't want to start looking for help then. 
Start looking for help before everything falls apart. And when trouble comes, as Paul said, when the day of evil comes, it's going to come for all of us. When you face sickness, when you face a financial challenge, when you face issues, you are already in connection with your commander, with your king. You are prepared. You've got strength. You've got wind in your sails. And maybe you're like, Lou, but I haven't done that and I'm in crisis now. Then you start praying now. It's never too late to start. But don't wait till it's too late. Start now and don't stop. Because the more connection you have with God, the better you're prepared for the day of evil. Never stop praying. Connect with God in every moment and in all circumstances. We all have our go-to prayers, right? The prayers that we, that we pray so often. Most of the time, I, I find that it's prayers where we request things from God. Like, God, help my family protect us, or help us make the, like, figure out our budget this month, or, or help with this sickness that we're facing. Some of us are also pretty good at Thanksgiving prayers. Thank you for my house and my clothes and my food. I really try to teach my girls that, to be thankful for everything they have. But sadly, that is where most of our prayers stop. It's things we ask for and things we sometimes say thank you for. But Paul says there should be more. You should be always busy with prayer. And my question is, how am I always busy with prayer? You have to expand your genre of prayer. People sometimes struggle with it because they're like, well, I've tried prayer, but it feels like my prayers are hitting the ceiling or I don't know what to say or what to do exactly. And I'm like, well, for those who are married, did you know exactly what to say on your first date? Sometimes people sit there awkwardly and they're like, oh, I wish the other person would just say something because I don't know what I have to say. Right? What if I say something wrong and they don't like me? How do you get through that? You keep talking. And the more you talk, the more you get familiar with each other, the more communication develops. After 14 years of being married to my wife, we don't even always have to say words. Sometimes we can just be in each other's presence, and that is okay. I don't always need to be talking. It's not awkward anymore. She doesn't always need to say something because we know each other. And we talk about all things, and we talk about everything. So if you're on that awkward first date, silent moment with God, get through it. Work through it. Because it takes time. You have to get to know God's heart. But be in a place of constant discussion with God. And it starts this way. Okay? And this might seem to you like counterintuitive to what I just said. But this is how constant conversation with God starts. By making an appointment. Like, but that's an appointment. That's not talking to him all the time. Go and read any good counselor that talks about marriages and relationships, and they will tell you that one of the keys to any healthy relationship is regular date nights. Why? Because that one date night sets me up for the rest of my week. You see, so we, I've built in appointments with God that sets me up for the rest of the day. Here's your easiest way to set appointments. Do what Jesus did. Just pray before every meal. We stopped doing that, right? In my house where I grew up, we would take hands, we would thank God for, and ask Him to bless the food. At the end of the meal, we would take hands again and we would thank Him for the food we just had. That's how I grew up. And that's exactly how or almost exactly as I raise raise my girls, every time before we eat, morning, lunch, dinner, we take hands and we thank God for our food. Three times a day, you're already connecting with God and the food is your reminder. In the mornings when I get up, the first thing I do is I don't check social media, don't check the newspaper. And Mike is not a newspaper, but a news app. It doesn't make me feel good. I do 10 minutes of mobility every morning when I get up. And while I'm doing that, I thank God for who he is and for putting breath in my lungs. Then I train. Then I go to my Bible study time and I pray again. And I've got three meals in between. 
And in the evenings, every evening before I go to bed, I pray again. There is six appointments that I don't even need to think of. It's when I get up. It's when I'm busy with my Bible studies, my three meals, and it's when I go to bed. And it sets up the rest of my day to be in a space where I can constantly be in conversation with God. The third thing he says is pray watchfully. He says in verse 18, be alert. That's something that we can very easily read over. The Greek word there, agrepnon says, Strong's dictionary says means, the word that's translated as be alert means, I'm not asleep, I am awake. And then they say, especially I am watchful, careful, I'm staying vigilant. It means when I'm praying, I'm not just going through the motions, I'm not just repeating a rhyme that I'm always saying over and over. I'm watchful, I'm vigilant, I'm thinking about what I am observing around me and what I am praying for. Remember, this is in the context of spiritual battle. So am I in a time when I'm experiencing spiritual attack? Am I in a time of peace? Am I in a time when I'm experiencing God's blessing, when I'm in the presence of God? Am I in a, am I in a time filled with worries and anxiety, whatever it might be? Think about where you are, the space you're thinking you're living in. Think about the things that keep you awake or that keeps you busy. And be alert. Notice that everything in this world is not just, Paul said, flesh and blood, fights against flesh and blood, but against evil spirits and rulers and authorities in the air. There is a real spiritual war. And if we're not alert to it, it will destroy us without us even knowing. And here's one of the easiest ways that I find to do it. If something bothers you, rather than complaining about it or gossiping about it, just pray about it. Know the state of Canada? It bothers you? Pray for it. You have an issue with your prime minister? Pray for him. You are anxious about something? The Bible says, pray about it. So be alert about the things that's going on in your heart. If you feel you're in a spiritual attack, what do you do? Pray about it. Just bring it before God. Don't just go through the motions. Be aware in prayer. You have a real enemy seeking your destruction. And if you are experiencing that you are in this space where you have to be aware because there's an enemy out to seek to destroy you, pray for God's protection. Pray for wisdom. Pray to be anchored with the armor of God. But then the fourth thing that Paul talks about he says, pray for others. Verse 18, pray for all of the saints, for all of the Lord's people. He says, pray also for me. One of the sad realities of most of our prayers in this hyper-individualized world that we live in is that our prayers, just as everything else, as our money, as our focus, as our priorities are all about me. The longest peace in this whole text about prayer is about praying for others. Andrew Murray, he was a great um, preacher in the Great Awakening revival in South Africa in the 1860s and a pretty famous theologian. And he said, if we would be delivered from the sin of limiting prayer. I love how he says that. He says limiting prayer, so to limit God in your prayer. He says that's a sin. Because we serve an almighty, powerful God. He says, if we would be delivered from the sin of limiting prayer, we must enlarge our hearts for the work of intercession. It's like if you want to get over your prayers that limit God, start praying for others. Stop praying for yourself. That's how you're going to pray bigger and bolder prayers. And he specifically asked to pray for the church in this case. For all of the saints, for all the Lord's people, and for him, he says. You know why? Because the enemy hates the church. Because the church belongs to Jesus. The church is the hope of the world. God's a plan to bring the good news of Jesus to people who need it. And he will do anything in his power to destroy what exists in the church. And I look at all of the splits and all of the issues that existed in the church for the last 
2,000 years. And I'm like, I wonder how many of these issues would have never existed if people actually in the church took the time to pray for each other rather than fight with each other. And often about minor things, not actually major things. It helps us to keep the unity and the fellowship alive in the church. Paul says, pray for church leadership. He says, pray for me that I would have the word, that I would fearlessly proclaim it. Why? Because if you think you're experiencing spiritual attacks, how do you think the leaders of the church, the elders, the pastor, the staff experiences it? This week I was at a conference where they spoke about the future of the church in Canada. More than 50% of the pastors in Canada are 55 years and older. Which means in the next 10 years, half of our pastors would be gone. And we already cannot find pastors for all of our churches in Canada. But here was a more shocking part of the research. 42% of pastors considered quitting vocational full-time ministry in 2023. 42, almost half. You know what was one of the main reasons? And I'm quoting, the brutality of ministry. Tired of constantly being beat up. Not by those outside the church, those in the church. Paul says, pray for your church leaders. I want to ask, pray for me. And not just praying for your local church, but pray for the global church. Because we're sitting comfortably in this air-conditioned and heated space today on our soft seats. And across the world, there are people sitting under trees today to just share the good news of Jesus. Across the world today, there are people meeting that if the police finds them, they will be thrown in prison for the fact that they serve Jesus. This is the point of what Paul is trying to make. Pray for others. Carry your spiritual family in prayer. We all have moments of weakness. We all have moments when we run out of steam, out of words, out of faith. And that's where we come in to support each other. That's where we come in to carry each other. You're not the only one facing storms in life. Your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ are also facing storms in life. So pray for each other. Martin Luther said, Prayer is the mightiest of all weapons that created natures can wield. You want to wield the mighty weapon? You want to live in the power that God has available for you? It's to start praying in the Spirit with the help of the Holy Spirit. It's to start praying constantly, not giving up on it. It's to start praying watchfully, being alert. It is to start praying for others. And I want to encourage you today that if you're sometimes like me and you cheat your prayer life, I want to ask you to make a decision today to cheat something else. Every yes is a no. Everything you say yes to on your calendar is a no to something else. And you're not just going to wake up magically tomorrow morning and you're going to feel like you want to spend time in prayer the whole day. So if you've been cheating your prayer life with God, decide to cheat something else. Take something else off of your calendar. Maybe it's all the sports and the extra activities that your kids participate in, which might rob them of the moment to be in the presence of God. Maybe it's one of your extra activities. Maybe it's worrying about how clean your house is. I don't know what it might be. But choose to rob something else. This is the mightiest of all the weapons we could ever wield. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for this mighty weapon called prayer. That we don't have to wonder if our prayers get through to some kind of God or force or something in the world, but that we know when we pray to the living God through the Holy Spirit that our prayers are brought before your throne. I'm thinking of those words again of Revelation. Our prayers are mixed with incense in this beautiful bowl that is brought before your throne. 
It's valuable. It's precious to you. And I thank you that when we come to you, that you hear our prayers, that you answer our prayers, that you strengthen us, that you guide us, that you lead us. I pray that we would become more comfortable in awkward silences so that we can wait on your spirit to talk to each of us, that we can learn how to wait on your spirit to guide us. Pray it in Jesus' name.